Hello, and welcome to Engage with Eagle Forum, a podcast to encourage the modern day woman and her vital role in shaping society. I'm one of your hosts, Tabitha Walter, the political director of Eagle Forum, and I'm joined by our executive director, Kirsten Hassler. Hello, everyone. You'll probably remember that last season, we introduced you to the topic of sexual orientation and gender identity. This ideology, which we'll probably refer to as SOGI in this discussion, has broad implications, not only for our laws, but also for our society in general. So we're gonna talk about it again today, specifically in terms of its impact on women and religious liberty. And to do so, we have guest Emily Cow. Emily is an attorney with a JD from Harvard Law School. And for the last 14 years, she has worked to defend religious freedom. She is currently the director of the Richard and Helen DeVos Center for Religion and Civil Society at the Heritage Foundation. And prior to working at Heritage, Emily worked at the State Department's Office of International Religious Freedom, Beckett Law, the United Nations, and Latham and Watkins. Emily also taught international human rights law as an adjunct law professor at George Mason University Law School. Welcome, Emily. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be on. All right, let's start with some basics. Emily, can you explain to us what sexual orientation and gender identity is as it relates to public policy and what proponents of this ideology want in terms of legal protections? Sure. So gender identity is a person's own internal perception of whether they are male or female, whether they identify as male or female. But these days it can go actually beyond simply male or female. As you might know, Facebook has 71 gender identities. So some people identify as non-binary, some people identify as gender fluid. So it really is um, breaking what they call the gender binary. But what's important to re remember about it for public policy is that it is, internal. It's completely subjective. It's what any person thinks in their mind at any given period of time. So that has major implications for public policy. Sexual orientation, well, I think most people know sexual orientation is who you're attracted to, and it can involve not only your feelings, but also your conduct. So the conduct of same-sex marriage. So that's an important distinction to remember also that when we talk about sexual orientation and public policy, we're not only talking about whether somebody identifies as gay or lesbian or bisexual or another sexual orientation, we're often also talking about their conduct. Mm -hmm. And so in the 116th Congress, that's the last session of Congress that began in 2018 and, and just ended in late 2020, saw many attempts to codify SOGI provisions into law. And to name a few, we saw that in the, the Violence Against Women Act and also in the Equality Act. And it is highly likely that these two bills will be passed by both chambers this time around because they have a Democratic majority. So if that happens, what are the consequences of this type of legislation, like the Equality Act on women? Well, this is a really important question, and I hope that they won't pass, um, and that's because they would have extremely harmful effects on the civil rights of women. So women have been recognized in civil rights law for many years, particularly in Title IX, which was a huge advancement for women in 1972. It gave them equal opportunities in education, both in academics and athletics. And as your listeners might have already heard, the idea of gender identity is basically deconstructing the idea of what it means to be a woman. So being a woman, now if gender identity were adopted into the law, it wouldn't be based on the objective facts of biological sex. And it wouldn't be based on the idea that you know there are men and there are women and we have sex differences it would be based entirely on a person's fluid internal sense of their gender identity. So the implications for that are that anybody who identifies as a woman can then claim to be a woman under the law. Well, what happens when a male identifies as a woman and claims to be a woman is that then, you know, for all purposes, the law will treat them as a woman if something like the Equality Act passes. So if they want to enter into a woman's single sex facility or a girl's single sex facility, whether that's a shower, locker room or bathroom, you know, the law would not see them any differently than a biological female. The same thing goes with girls and women's sports. And we've already seen the devastating consequences 
when gender identity trumps biological sex. Then you have you know, men who've gone through, test, gone through puberty, had this huge surge of testosterone that has made them stronger, larger, fitter than females entering into women's sports, taking away medals and uh, records from women and just destroying fairness in women and girls sports. Right. I think that's what, you you know, you said we're seeing that already and what people aren't making the connection who are proponents of, of things like the Equality Act is that it's actually stripping away women's rights instead of lifting them up. And there, like you said, there is something inherently valuable about having the sexes uh, different from each other. Well, the reality is that, you know, there are two sexes. There, there is a gender binary. Um, there are some people who are born with uh, disorders, but that is a very, very tiny minority of people. The fact is that we make public policy for the majority of people who are either born, you know, male or female, very clearly defined by our biology, by our reproductive systems. And the law has created separate spaces for males and female. Ruth Bader Ginsburg talked about that in the decision where the Supreme Court ruled on Virginia Military Institute and allowed women to enter into VMI. And they said, she said, women should still have separate spaces to disrobe, to sleep. And that goes for, for men too. Men also want to have separate spaces to you know, perform private functions. And that's something that our society and societies all around the world have respected for millennia. But now this radical idea of gender identity threatens to overturn that for the entire population. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. It, you know, it seems like these provisions to me um, to identity groups are counterproductive. Doesn't our constitution already have protection for all individuals? Yes, our constitution does have um, equal protection in the 14th Amendment, and our constitutional rights are jeopardized by um, legislation like the Equality Act, which would destroy, ironically, equality for women and girls. It would really set women and girls back. It's very regressive, not even though it's being brought in the name of progress. When the law doesn't even recognize, you know, that women are a distinct category that, you know, it's not just an idea to be a woman, it's a fact. Uh, We know that women and men are different and this has shaped our law in so many ways, you know, whether it comes to sports, single sex facilities, um, when it comes to pregnancy and uh, related conditions. And that's that's another issue we should talk about is how the Equality Act would create all all access abortion. Um, So the law has, you know, been developing for many years to create more equal treatment for women. There have been many cases of sex discrimination brought in the past where you know, women were treated more poorly than men. Um, but all of those advancements would really be undone if we no longer really have a cognizable idea of what it means to be a woman. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, that's the key right there. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, let's switch gears just a little bit. And so when you hear the term SOGI or sexual orientation and gender identity, religious freedom may not seem like it's relevant, but that's really not the case as as we're going to find out. Um, Can you tell us a little bit why SOGI is not compatible with religious freedom? Sure. Well, because many religious believers, religious organizations, um, houses of worship, social service groups, have beliefs based on their religious beliefs about sex, sexuality, marriage, um, and sex differences. So we've seen conflicts in several states between religious believers or religious organizations um, and these SOGI laws. So for instance, right now, the Supreme Court is considering an important case that arose out of Philadelphia, where the city of Philadelphia no longer would work with Catholic charities because Catholic charities has a foster program where they've been placing foster children with a mom and a dad. Um, 
the city of Philadelphia decided that that violated their SOGI non-discrimination policy. They said that that violated their um, sexual orientation non-discrimination policy. The Catholic Church has not made its you know, beliefs for the last several thousand years on marriage um, in regard to other people's sexual orientation. Those are the beliefs that they've had because of what the Bible teaches. And they continue to live out their beliefs in the public square. It has nothing to do really with sexual orientation. They simply believe that children should have a mom and a dad. So they don't place you know, foster children also you know, with, with two friends or two siblings of the same sex. They place children with a mom and a dad. And because of that belief, they've now come into contact conflict with this SOGI policy that Philadelphia has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on, and, you know, on that same subject of children, let's talk um, somewhat about schools. What do the SOGI policies in our schools look like these days? Well, we are hearing from parents across the country who are very concerned about the SOGI policies that are being adopted at the local level, at the state level, and now with President Biden's new executive order, it comes from the federal level. So what SOGI policy does, in addition to what we've already talked about with the single sex facilities, creating you know, an all access policy to girls restrooms and locker and girls sports, um, it also has often led to the implementation of um, SOGI as really an overarching framework for the entire school environment. So that includes teachers having to use preferred pronouns for children who identify as transgender, which can be really confusing to other students. It has also included adding curriculum into um, you know, children's uh, schoolwork as young as kindergarten. So giving kindergartners books like I Am Jazz, which teaches that, you know, a girl can be trapped in a boy's body. And we've seen parents, again, across the country from all different backgrounds, just very concerned about their kids becoming confused about their sex, becoming uncomfortable with their bodies, because the school is actually encouraging them to question whether they were born in the wrong body, which is not something that any school or any teacher should be suggesting to a child. Children are not born in the wrong body. We are our bodies. Um, there are children who have gender dysphoria and that should be dealt with um, with the appropriate counseling and medical treatment. But the transgender movement is importing its ideology into schools, which tells children not only that they're trapped in the wrong body, but that they should change their bodies. And that's very dangerous. Yeah, it's so sad too. And, you know, I, and Tabitha, I think too, we're particularly concerned with parental rights as it, because we are both mothers of, of young boys. And I just want to give a little bit of an example of something that we found on Twitter. So the ACLU tweeted out some in, infographics a couple of weeks ago entitled, quote, the four myths about trans people in school sports debunked, end quote. And so this is going to be a bit long, but I think it's worth reading. If you're anything like me, I sometimes find it really hard to, to believe that what I have been told concerning certain ideology is actually true. But here is some hard evidence that this ideology is being used at the school level. So the ACL tweeted, quote, this is just the first one, myth one, trans girls are girls. There is no one way for our bodies to be. Women, including women who are transgender, intersex, or disabled, have a range of different characteristics. Biological sex and gender are not binaries. There are no set hormone ranges, body parts, or chromosomes that all people of our particular sex or gender have. If you want to look at the other three myths, just do a quick internet search of the ACLU and transgender myths and you'll find the thread. We will also post it on our social media throughout the week. But Emily, my question for you is, so what can be done to not only protect our children, our girls, but also us women when the other side is just so blatantly in denial of truth? In this case, that biological sex distinctions are up to the individual rather than biology. So it's important to remember that the ACLU is not a medical organization. <laughs> <laughs> it's a legal organization and a very liberal progressive one. Um, and they've chosen, you know, to advance their ideology by denying the fact of biology. Um, 
I, maybe there are a few people who are going to go along with that, but I think the vast majority of Americans realize that biological sex is our daily reality. Again, we are our bodies. Um, and it doesn't do anyone any good to deny the fact that you know we are born male and female. And there, again, there are people who have gender dysphoria and that's an issue that's a very serious medical condition that we need to treat with sensitivity and with the proper care. But simply erasing women from the law, erasing girls from the law and violating our civil rights and endangering children is incredibly authoritarian. It, it violates the rights of a vast number of Americans in order to promote a particular ideology. And what we're seeing with laws like the Equality Act with President Biden's executive order, um, we're seeing the politicization of medicine and the politicization of education. And that's very dangerous. And that has consequences for children especially, and it also can lead to the undermining of parental rights. If you go to the doctor's office and the doctor is operating according to a political ideology rather than according to medicine and science, parents are left in a very, very difficult position. Are they going to follow recommendations that have been politicized? And if they don't, what does that mean? And we can unpack the consequences of that. Similarly, in the education context, if parents don't agree with their children you know, being taught that they could be trapped in the wrong body, that puts them in opposition to the school. And if it all becomes law, parents are going to be up against the law. Mm -hmm. I think that's what's so important. I mean, Emily, you have a very legal uh, background. I'm just thinking, I'm just wondering how, um, how you refute something that's not rooted in scientific method or even reality. How do you combat that on the legal level? Well, I think we have to recognize where the ideology comes from. A lot of this ideology that we're seeing now around gender identity and sexual orientation, it comes from critical gender theory and queer theory. And that is, you know, the cousin of critical race theory. It all originated from critical theory and cultural Marxism. And so I think, you know, just beginning with that, we need to recognize that there is an ideological agenda that is being advanced here. And it's it's contrary to the facts, it's contrary to the science. We need to protect the, the conscience rights of medical doctors who are speaking out against the transgender community's recommendations for children um, that are radical, that involve children going onto puberty blockers at age eight, and then going onto cross-sex hormones and having top and bottom surgeries before they're even you know, able to drive. I mean, these are surgeries and hormonal treatments that have irreversible consequences as my former colleague, Dr. Ryan Anderson has written as Abigail Schreier has highlighted. So we need to protect those who are experts in science and medicine and protect their ability to speak out. Unfortunately, again, the Equality Act would silence doctors and other medical professionals you know, who are trying to deal seriously with issues like gender dysphoria on the basis of facts in medicine. Um, and the law needs to be, you know, carefully considered and the law needs to be made on the basis of facts and investigation and evidence, not based on ideology. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So on that note, um, you have been working on an amazing initiative called Promise to America's Children that has a ton of resources for parents and lawmakers. Can you talk about that initiative? Yes, I'd be delighted to. So the Promise to America's Children is a place where parents and lawmakers can unite to protect children. We all recognize that children today are endangered by cultural forces and political forces that seek to sexualize them at an early age and introduce them to this destructive gender ideology. So in addition to all the pernicious things that we see in our culture from pornography um, that's spreading in entertainment. We also see that in the classroom and in the med medical profession that these dangerous ideas are being advanced through laws, through policy, through, with our taxpayer dollars. And so the Promise to America's Children lays out 10 principles to protect children's minds, bodies, and their relationships with their parents. And it's open to the general public, to lawmakers, to sign on to the promise 
and to go on to the Promise to America's Children website and learn about legislative efforts at the state and federal level to protect children and to uphold parental rights. That is sure to be such a valuable resource for parents. And Eagle Forum has officially endorsed this effort and we will make it easily accessible to you. So make sure you're signed up for our email alerts so you don't miss it. But also, if you wanna go back to listen to our previous episodes related to Soji, please go check out Erin Brewer's powerful testimony of her own battle with gender dysphoria in episode number 36. And then also our discussion with Concerned Women for America's Doreen Denny concerning women's sports in episode number 40. And thank you so much for joining us, Emily. This was a very enlightening episode. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. And then for those of you who are listening to this episode, be sure to subscribe, share with your friends, and leave us a review. You can find us on all the major social media outlets and at engagewitheagleform.com. From your house to the state house to the White House, this is Engage with Eagle Forum coming at you with a special segment so are we are we for sure on swamp beat i don't know <laughs> i think it'd be cute all right so we're doing another swamp beat tabitha yep here we go <laughs> <laughs> hey guys we are back with another swamp beat for the week of february 22nd you may have noticed that we skipped a week and that's because we recorded one for impeachment that was supposed to be released last monday but the Senate pulled a fast one on us and decided to acquit former President Trump the Saturday before. So we had to scrap it. But we still detailed all of the drama of impeachment in our latest Capitol Hill report from Thursday. So if you wanna know about that, then head on over to our Facebook page and check that out. And we have something else to talk about today though, still brought to you by the letter I, (laughs) and that's immigration. So Biden is hoping to get a massive amnesty plan through Congress in the upcoming weeks. This would give a path to citizenship to 11 million illegal immigrants through various programs, including the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program, which is also referred to as DACA. Um, It will also do away with mandatory E-Therify, which is a system to check citizenship status of individuals. That's a tongue twister. (laughs) It would also get rid of the public charge rule, which has protected taxpayers from shouldering the burden of immigrants who would have to depend on the federal government for long-term benefits. Right. Now, Biden has already stopped border wall construction and, and allowed these individuals coming into the U.S. to skip COVID testing, which is crazy to me. This is incentivizing immigrants to come, of course. In fact, the uptick of immigrants crossing the U.S.-Mexico border has been absolutely unbelievable. The U.S. Customs and Border Protection has reported that the authorities have made 78,000 arrests in January alone. Single adult Mexican citizen encounters have increased almost 119% over the last year and almost all categories of illegal immigrants increased about 6% since this last December. Listen, guys, we want the U.S. to be attractive and be the land of success. Like, who wouldn't want to come here? We want to give others the hope of the American dream. However, the immigration issue is just so much more complex than just extending a hand of welcome. We simply don't have the structure to give millions of immigrants benefits. I mean, look at our debt alone. We're trying to (laughs) overcome that. And I don't know, maybe Kirsten and I are the only ones trying to overcome it because it doesn't seem like Congress is doing a lot about it right now. Um, And we are in the midst of a pandemic right now. Um, We need to make sure that our safety is a priority, um, both health and physical safety. So, Um, There are just some fundamental reforms that need to happen first before we can allow uh, a large amount of immigrants to become citizens. You know, even Senator Mitt Romney, who is squishy on a lot of conservative issues, has made statements saying that this plan isn't the answer. So, Kirsten, what are the chances of this passing? Well, some good news there. Slim (laughs) to none. 
And here's where the swamp gets really swampy. <laughs> no one can come to a consensus on immigration, whether it's on the Democratic side or on the Republican side. And President Biden has said that he would sit down with Republicans and negotiate, but many of his priorities are non-starters for Republicans in the first place. Plus, if it were to pass in the Senate, House Democrats have a history of filling bills full of poison pills and then not allowing Republicans to offer amendments. So that would kill any Republican support in the House and Senate. We are going to stamp this as dead on arrival. Yeah, so there you go. More wasted time by the Democrats. I don't know, maybe that's what we should call this segment since all we report on is the time that Congress wastes. <laughs> so, um, I mean, landfills and swamps have similar connotations, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, guys, we will talk to you next time. Bye.